Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Paul Gantel. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, uh, um, today I'm going to talk about uh, Python Date Util. It's a library for uh, uh, dealing with dates and times, and that's sort of dates and times and that sort of thing. Uh, everyone knows that's super fun to deal with. It's not a dry and boring subject. So strap yourselves in. It's going to be. It's in. It's going to be. You know, a mile a minute ride. Um, so. Oh, and I, I should say this is a. Uh, this is something that I got. This is something that I got involved in maybe like a year and a half ago, and have been kind of the primary maintainer. Surprisingly, a lot of these libraries like this, they are like, they are like, crucially like, have very little attention paid to them. So, if you want to do some really fun work, you know, you can stop by Date Detail, uh, Date Detail, uh, or other libraries like that. Uh, okay, so just a, uh, I'm going to format this kind of like uh, just an overview, just an overview tutorial on like how to use a library. Um, so, the five basic modules uh, are relative delta are relative delta which is uh, for handling sort of calendar offsets it's just uh, about you know uh, meaningful ways to meaningful ways to reduce some of the ambiguity around uh, telling how long it is between uh, two uh, dates um, uh, dates um, our rule is uh, an implementation of the i calendar spec for recurrence rules so that's if you want to generate a series of dates series of dates based on some rules of increasing complexity uh, and then TZ module, we uh, provide um, just provide um, just uh, like a whole bunch of, of different um, uh, TZ info subclasses. So however you want to generate your time zone, uh, time zone uh, information, hopefully we'll be able to parse it. Um, and then the parser, which is the sort of auto magical uh, function where you give it a string, where you give it a string that looks like a date, and it gives you a date. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to go too much into that, but I, I, I will try and point out some try and point out some pitfalls. Um, and then uh, there's the Easter module. I'm not going to talk about that beyond this because I can explain what it does. I can explain what it does in about two seconds. It tells you when Easter is. So, uh, so, we'll, uh, so we'll start with the uh, relative delta. Um, so the relative delta, it's as opposed to time delta, which tells you how much time it tells you how much time has elapsed between two events. A relative delta gives you some fuzzier definition of what happens between two, say, calendar dates. Say calendar dates. Um, so I, I'll give some examples, but you know, one month from now, right? Th what does that mean? Does it mean 30 days? Does it mean, you know, 30.14 days? Who knows, right? Um, there's two ways to construct these. Um, one is just like a time delta. You just like a time delta, you can just give it the raw inputs, the um, all the components of the relative delta. Uh, and the other is as a difference is as a difference between two dates. So just like you can take two date times and subtract them to get a time delta, you can pass two date times to relative delta to relative delta to uh, generate um, a relative delta that tells their relative distance. So, um, um, so the when constructing the relative delta, there's uh, two broad categories of uh, arguments. There's uh, arguments. There's the absolute arguments. And these are uh, all the ones that have um, singular. They're singular. They don't end in an S, basically. An S, basically. Um, and these are basically equivalent to calling the replace method on a date time. Right? It just when you add or subtract your relative delta, your relative delta to slash from a uh, date time, it will. F the first thing it'll do is it'll take each one of these, uh, uh, each one, uh, each one of these components from the date time and replace it with its equivalent on the relative delta it specified. So, for example, this is a relative delta. This is a relative delta that, if you add it or add it to or subtract it from a uh, date time, it gives you the same date and time, but in 2015. But in 2015, right? I just specified the year. Um, and this one is one where I've only specified the time aspects of this. So time aspects of this. So if I add this to any given date, no matter what the time section of it is, it's going to give me 12:15 uh, on 12:15 on that date, right? So it's a common thing, I guess. Um, the other uh, type of arguments that you're going to get are arguments that you're going to get are relative arguments. So these are the ones that are pluralized, um, and these are basically offsets from offsets from the the date time. Um, so, uh, one one thing is that you know if you you know if you want something that's one month away, this is going to give you one calendar month. It's going to try and give you the same date, uh, but one month from now. But one month from now, if that date doesn't exist, so for example, if we're here, we go one year from 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 2016, uh, 2016 uh, January 29th, uh, and one month. That's going to try and give us February 29th. It's just going to fall back to February 20th. Fall back to February 28th. So this is the kind of thing that 
this is useful for is so that you don't have to add your own logic about you know handling leap years or handling leap years or or the ragged ends of months. Um, in, and one thing to note is that with this, the normal addition subtraction addition subtraction multiplication rules apply. So um, you know if you subtract 15 days, that's going to give you 15 days ago. It's not going to just it's not going to just always add to it. Uh, so a, a special type of the relative argument. I mean, you could argue that it's relative or, or absolute or absolute. Uh, is these uh, weekdays. And what these tell you is uh, if you want a date that matches a specific day of the week, specific day of the week, right? So this first one I can construct it is something that you add it to something and it gives you the Sunday following the date that you added it, following the date that you added it to, right? So here I just generated three. One of the two, one of them, or two, these last two, they're in the same week. They're in the same week. So the first one you add it, it's already Sunday. It gives you that Sunday. You add it to Three days later, it gives you the eighth. Three days later, it gives you the eighth. You add it to three days after that, it's still not the eighth, so it gives you the eighth. Um, you can also pass, uh, an, ar pass uh, an argument to these uh, these dates that or the, the weekdays that will it says you know an additional offset. So this an additional offset. So this is saying give me not next Wednesday but the Wednesday after next, and you can see you know it works essentially the same way. Um, um, sorry. Uh, the other thing. Uh, the, the thing that makes this kind of uh, particular, kind of uh, particularly fancy, is that you can uh, kind of add these all together to get some very specific uh, rules about uh, rules about what the next date is supposed to be. Right. So here I have something. This is just some very simple logic that says, if I'm given a date, if I'm given a date, I want to jump to the beginning of the next month. Right. So that adds one month. And remember, we're always going to be in the same. We're always going to be in the same month. Uh, and then it's going to reset the absolute argument of days to one. So, so, you know, no matter what month you are, it gives you the next month and uh, one, uh, the first of the month. Uh, uh, and then this guy, uh, this is going to say it's going to add one year, and then it's going to set to first. It's going to first. It's going to reset it to February first, and then it's going to add it. Uh, it's going to go for the third Monday after that date, and so that's it. And so that's going to give you the third Monday in February, which is Martin Luther King Day. So this is a, a an object that if you add it to a date time, it gives you a date time. It gives you the Martin Luther King Day for the next year, right? So if I multiply and if I multiply that by a number, it's really only going to multiply the way to multiply the relative components, right? So since the only real relative component that's multiplicative is the uh, year component, you know, and, you know, I can just do this and I can generate the Martin Luther King Day for the next you know three years, right? Uh, but that's not actually, but that's not actually probably the most efficient way to generate Martin Luther King Day dates, um, because we have this thing called an R rule, which is a rule, which is a, an R, it's a it's an RFC um, uh, called the I calendar specification, uh, but uh, but kind of confusing. I think it was from Microsoft, so I, I, don't, I don't know what the name confusion is like with uh, uh, Apple's products, uh, Apple's products there. Um, so this is for generating recurrences. Uh, with some potentially complex interval. Complex interval. So, for example, one thing you could do with this is if you want to know all of Pat Morita, the uh, actor from Happy Days who ran the diner, from Happy Days who ran the diner, um, if you want to know all the times that his birthday fell on a Monday, you can do that. And if you want to get the subset, get the subset of those that happened during the Vietnam War, you can get that he had two of them. It was 1965 and 1971. So our rules were so our rules were originally invented to generate Happy Days trivia. But it turns out that they are useful for other things. Um, so, um, so the basic components of an R rule is the start date. That's what the basis of the rule is. The start date, the start date may or may not be part of the rule. It may be excluded from the rule depending on what the other things are. Um, freak or frequency or frequency is, I don't know, it's technically not the frequency of it. It's really more the units of the fundamental frequency, but this is the mental frequency, but this is sort of like, it, does the rule apply on a yearly basis or a monthly basis or what? And then the interval, which is actually the frequency, but it's frequency, but it's implicitly one. Um, and that is, you know, uh, how, ma uh, how many periods of the, f many periods of the, f of the fundamental frequency do you wait before you create a new uh, recurrence? So, oh, I forgot to reorder these. Well, I have to reorder these. Well, no matter. Uh, so here's an example. This is an, the first rule is an hourly rule with interval one. Starts at 9 a.m. Starts at 9 a.m. Um, and then uh, so you can see I generate that. I ask for the first three of them. Of the first three of them, I'll go into this count thing a little bit later. 
uh, so it's going to give me 9, 10, 11. If I replace the interval here, I, 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 here, I, I, I set it from, instead of uh, setting it to 1, I set it to 2. Starting at 9, it's going to give me 9, 11, 13, right? Uh, right? Uh, 13 is 1 o'clock. Um, or if I start at a different start time, obviously it's going to go 10, 11, 12. 11, 12. Um, so that's fairly straightforward, but the real interesting parts of, of the recurrence rules of the recurrence rules come about uh, when you start using these uh, by rules, um, and these uh, modify the frequency in some way. Modify the frequency in some way. They have their own set of, of frequencies by month, month, day, etc. Um, and the way they work, and the way they work is, if the by rule is of a frequency that is greater or equal to the fundamental frequency, then it's constrained. Then it's constrained, right? So for the example here. I'm going to say generate a rule that's daily, but by month, no, by month, November, by weekday, Tuesday. So this is going to filter out anything that's not a Tuesday in November. So, so if I start at 2015, uh, it's going to the first date it's going to give me is in November. It'll give me four Novembers, four Novembers, and then it'll give me um, uh, 2016's first November. Uh, and then, and then. For by rules that are less than the fundamental frequency, that is more a—I um, don't know what you call it. I don't know what you call it, like a sideband or something, right? It, it increases the frequency. So if I have a monthly rule, and I apply it by month day, I have by month day, and month days, there's multiple months, uh, multiple days in a month. This is going to give me every occurrence of of these month days within each month. So here I'm going to say this says. Um, Every month, I want the 1st, 15th, and 30th, 15th, and 30th of the month. So you see, I started after the 15th. So even though I started on the 16th, that DT start is not, DT start is not in the rule because it doesn't match. But it's going to give me, it gives me 1st to 30th. Then we move into February. Then we move into February. There's no 30th in February. So when it hits that, the RFC says you drop it. So the, uh, it skips dates that don't, dates that don't exist. Um, so you can see. And it will just continue on this way. It'll give you first, fifteenth, and thirtieth of all the rest of the months. Fifth of all the rest of the months. Um, so if you don't limit these rules in any way, they'll just be generated infinitely, generated infinitely, or until Python can no longer represent the dates. Um, so obviously they're generated lazily. Um, um, there are two ways to specify how to terminate the rule as part of the rule itself, one, and these are one, and these are mutually exclusive. Um, just by because of the RFC, it, it's not logically necessary for them to be mutually necessary for them to be mutually exclusive. Um, so here you can the first one is count. It's pretty self, pretty self-explanatory. If I give count if I give count two, it uh, gives me the first two occurrences. Uh, the second is until, and that stops generating stops generating occur recurrences uh, when we reach that date, and that is inclusive. So. If the until is a recurrence, until is a recurrence, it will be returned. Um, so, even if you don't have limiting uh, 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 information in the rule itself, you can still um, retrieve subsets of it uh, using the, method, using the methods on the, on the object. So, for example, this is the after method. You pass it a date. It gives you the next recurrence that happens after that uh, after that uh, um, after that date. There's a corresponding before method. Um, and then there's also a between method where you between method where you give it two dates, and I think this is inclusive, um, and it'll give you all the dates between. Uh, this is also this, there's this by Easter rule. This is not part of the RFC spec. This is uh, an extension. I don't know who added it, but uh, it's uh, it's I think it's a date util exclusive. So here I'm just passing a by Easter of zero, and this tells me when Easter was um, in um, in the 90s because I specified. Uh, I want the dates between those two. Um, so, um, so while these rules are kind of powerful, they can't really express everything that you would want to express. So when you want to uh, when you want to uh, get something really complicated, you would use a, an R rule set, which allows you to combine rule uh, recurrence rules, uh, recurrence rules, uh, you know, either adding them or subtracting them, and you can also combine and uh, add and subtract dates. So I'm just going to work through an example where we're going to generate example where we're going to generate a fictional bus schedule. So let's imagine that the bus comes from 6 to 11, it comes on 30, comes on 37, and it uh, comes every hour, except in the evenings, it comes at, um, it, um, it, it, it comes every other hour, right? 
So first, I'm going to generate uh, an R rule that uh, gives uh, gives me every hour on the uh, on the 37 uh, for just the weekdays, right? I'm just the weekdays, right? I'm limiting this to the weekdays, and um, from six to ten. But that's too many dates, right? Or that's too many times, right? There's going to be too many times, right? There's going to be two extras. So then what I do is I, I'm going to take this, I'm going to generate the same schedule, but instead of generating all the dates, I'm generating all the dates, I'm going to generate just the ones I want to drop. And then I apply that, I add that to my R rule set as an X rule. And, and what that's going to do is it's when an X rule and an R rule are the same, they cancel out and you don't get a recurrence. Um, so then my fictional bus schedule on the weekends, schedule's a little different. Uh, 8 to 8, it comes on the, it comes on the 7, or 8.07 to 7.07, right? Basically the same thing, but now I've limited it to the weekends. Um, um, so in my fictional town that has kind of poor bus service, they also have uh, scheming politicians. So, politicians. so on November 8th, which is election day, they've decided that they don't want people who take the bus to be voting. So they arrange to, they arrange to uh, uh, have the schedule just taken off. The bus is out of service. So if I want to reflect that in my code, that in my code I can generate all the dates between uh, on that day, and I'm going to add them one by one as exceptions to the, rule, to the rule to say, if this is a recurrence, it doesn't occur. But they're not totally heartless. They're going to offer you one bus in the morning, one bus in the morning at 4.32 in the morning, and one in the evening at 7.49. The polls close at 8, so you're probably not going to be able to make it in time. Able to make it in time. Um, so these are just one-off ex uh, exceptions, again, but in the positive direction. So now I'm just going to add those. So now I'm just going to add those as an R date, right? The rule is on that date it occurs. So now that I have the schedule. I can take this and this, and I've hidden the part of this where I turn it into a pandas data frame and uh, arrange it like this. But now you can see this is the result of the output. The result of the output organized as a bus schedule, and we've got a rule that generates a bus schedule, uh, and that's the week collection day. This is there. This is there. Scheming uh, schedule. All right. So uh, I'm going to move on to um, uh, the, time, uh, the time zones. Uh, so time zones are obviously incredibly tricky. And uh, I, could probably spend, I could probably spend an entire talk just giving you crazy edge cases about people who switched over from the, uh, the international date line, international date line, or some crazy thing like that. Um, but I think I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the key features of the time zone so you can maybe, so you can maybe just have an understanding of a little bit of what's going on here. So um, uh, the, TZ module the TZ module provides a number of ways to construct time zones because there are a huge number of ways that people have devised to specify time zones. time zones. But the important ones are, first there's UTC. So this is just an alias for UTC. No offset, no DST. It's called UTC. And this is the, and this is the, um, this is the basic thing. If you're working with timestamps, uh, your, op your optimal situation would be convert your stuff to, uh, your stuff to uh, UTC and work in UTC. It's very simple. Um, we also provide a TZ local, which is just a wrapper, which is just a wrapper around Python's functions that allow you to query the operating system's time zone information. Um, so here, you know, so here, you know, you can see I'm on Eastern time. And uh, but if I were to set my TZ environment TZ environment variable to UTC, it would give me UTC. If I set my environment variable to um, uh, Pacific time, it'll give me Pacific time. It'll give me Pacific time. And that's not just the offset for today. It will give you the, um, the, the offset for any given day. So for any given day. So you specify any day. However, usually your best situation is uh, if, you know, if you know specifically what time zone you're in in terms of like the ge uh, geographical, uh, geographical and political position of the, of the, of the date you want to express, right? And the best way to do this is to use one of, is to use one of these uh, INA or they call it the Olson database uh, zone info files. Uh, if you have a NIC system, uh, it system, uh, it ships with this automatically. Um, Windows does not, um, but uh, Bitutil will uh, ship a, uh, ship a zone info file. But I, I would caution you against actively using that. Uh, it really just use the normal Bitutil uh, uh, time zone handling logic, and it will fall back if you don't have it. But uh, you know, unless you update your date util all the time, util all the time, uh, your time zone file is probably going to get uh, out of out of sync. Uh, anyway, so these are very useful. In, these are very useful in the sense that um, 
they provide all the historical zone information about uh, a given zone. So here's the, new, here's the New York zone, and today it's Eastern Daylight Time. In 1944, it was Eastern War Time. It was Eastern War Time, which is, uh, it was just a permanent daylight savings time that happened during World War II. And if I go back all the way to 1901, uh, uh, that was before UTC was invented, and so this happens to have information uh, for the local mean solar time. So th these are how so th these are how dates were expressed in New York in 1901. So obviously that's powerful, and if you can, you should use it. Um, the way you get those, don't construct them directly from the files. Use the getTZ file. The getTZ file is kind of the equivalent, the auto the equivalent, the auto magical parser function, but for time zones. You pass it something that looks like a time zone, and hopefully it will give you the right time zone. If you pass it, if you pass it nothing. It assumes you want local time. So it'll look for the best thing that looks like local time. If you pass it, a, uh, if you pass it a, um, uh, a, 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 an Olsen time zone, it'll give you uh, that. And it'll either pull it from your local file, local file, or from the date utility fallback. And if you want to express some new uh, time, zone TZ time zone TZ variable, you can do that. And this will give you uh, time zone in, in Australian Eastern time. Uh, from from uh, from from uh, another one of the, the TZ subclass I didn't mention. Uh, one thing to note, though, is I did a major overhaul. Did a major overhaul of how the time zone backend works um, for the forthcoming 2.6.0 release, which will be coming up. Release, which will be coming up, coming out probably next week. So, if there's any chance that you're going to have to represent something like an ambiguous date, an ambiguous date, right? Like this is 1:30, 2004, October 31st there was a daylight saving time transition, so there were two 1.30s there. there. In the old version of DateTail, there's no way to express this first date. You always get the second one. It causes a discontinuity in some continuity in some systems, because um, even if you started with UTC, as I'm doing here, um, it doesn't translate properly. Translate properly. But the new version will. You can also just use PyTZ. They have, they can, uh, they have a slightly different way of handling, slightly different way of handling their time zones, but, um, they do handle this correctly. Um, all right. Uh, the final thing I'm just going to quickly go over. I'm just going to quickly go over is the parser. It doesn't require that much explanation because it's it's designed not to. So you can either instantiate a parser, instantiate a parser object, and parse, or you can just use the default parse method. You just give this something that looks like a date, and it pulls out, and it pulls out. It'll do its best to turn that into a date. So, you know, uh, there's some fuzziness around there where you might get the wrong date, and there's a date, and there's basically no transparency here about how it was generated. But you can sort of reason about it like here. You can say here. You can see it's going to try and it's going to try and say it once year, uh, day, month, year. But if that doesn't work, if that doesn't work, it's going to give you here, you know, it's going to say, all right, well, if it's not day, month, year, it must be month, day, year. And here, it can't be month, day, year. It can't be month, day, year. So this guy has to be year, uh, month, day. Um, so when, to, uh, when should you use the, the parser? Only use it if you don't know the format of the date, or, or if you want to pull out a date that's not just a date, you can use this fuzzy keyword to just pull out a date from a string, pull out a date from a string. Obviously, if this guy's name was April, that could be a problem. Um, so the other, uh, the other uh, time is that the, the STRP time um, uh, Mechanism for parsing mechanism for parsing dates where you know the format doesn't really handle uh, time zones correctly. So, uh, if you need to parse a date that has time zone information, that has time zone information, DateUtil will do that in many cases. So, here's an example where these guys are it guys are it understands how to turn these these formats into offsets. Be aware though, this uses the POSIX format, and POSIX is and POSIX is completely backwards. So, CST minus eight means eight hours ahead of you. UTC. UST minus, UST minus 4 means 4 hours ahead of UTC. So it's bizarre. But a bare minus 0, 4, 0, 0, 4, 0, 0 does mean UTC minus 4. It's very confusing, but that is the ambiguity inherent in parsing dates. Uh, the, uh, the only other thing I'll say about time zones is if you have a limited subset of time zones that it could be, like for example, CST, IST, CST, IST, these are overloaded terms, but a lot of times when you're printing things, uh, you use the local TZ name. So if you know that you have dates, you know that you have dates only coming from India and China, you can specify if it's IST, give me this. If it's CST, give me that. Otherwise, you don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. Uh, 
So, all right, that's the end of the talk. Uh, just want to give my plug for if you guys want to help out, come on GitHub out. Come on GitHub, like you dive into issues. Uh, we could probably use help by reformatting the documentation. I've been pretty terrible about that. Um, um, I'm also, uh, the parser it's not, doesn't have enough transparency, and I don't think there's, uh, there's um, I, um, I think it could be really improved. So I, I'm going to be trying to solicit uh, feedback on the parser. So if you use the parser or you want to use the parser, um, parser um, you, know, you can get in touch, and uh, I'm going to try and come up with a sort of mini RFC about how I'm going to change the parser. parser. And then finally, I'm a big believer in the web of trust, especially with software and stuff. So if you guys want to cross sign my keys that I use to sign my keys that I use to sign the library when I release it, uh, this is my PGP key, and I have them on little slips. I can show you my ID if you want to cross sign my key, uh, or sign my key, uh, or you know, you can show me yours, or you can just sign it. It doesn't have to be cross signed. So, and if you don't understand that, feel free to ask me, and I'll explain that to you. All right, All right. So, uh, uh, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. What, what's Sorry, in, in your in your uh, singular args, singular args, um, do you handle a negative? So can you say something like the last Thursday in a month? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Those the weekdays, uh, those can be negative, um, and that that is how they're interpreted, I think. Okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, those are more relative. They're like a hybrid. It's relative slash, you know. Okay. In other words, use it cautiously. Play with it. Use it cautiously. Play with it. Yeah. I mean, it's really. I think what you'd really do is you'd get the first of the next month, and then you'd get one Sunday before that to get the last. Before that to get the last Sunday in the month. There, there, there's examples in the documentation of that. Okay. And then, then can you also do say the so do say the so I'm thinking of like some financial products where it's you know it's the last Friday within the of the you know within 30 days you know within 30 days it's the last Friday of the 30 days. Uh, well, I mean, you could generate an R rule and then specify within 30 days or 30 days or I'm not sure. Oh, I, I get it. You know, say it. do the between, but then the last Friday that. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'd have to think about exactly how you'd want to do that. Okay. Exactly how you'd want to do that. Okay. I mean, worst case scenario, you just generate the last two and then find out which ones are within 30 days. Within the 30 days. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just have two quick questions. Um, the first, um, since time zone data is always changing, is there like a canonical source of time zone data out there? Time zone data out there. The second, like, how does a parser work internally? It saved my ass so many times. Like, is it a bunch of like regular expressions, or like, how does it work? Um, how does it work? Um, okay, so the first one, that that's the uh, IANA, IANA time zone uh, database that I mentioned. Uh, usually, your operating usually your operating system ships with it, and uh, when it gets updated, which happens about 15, 16 times a year, um, your operating your operating system is responsible for that, and that's why I say use GetTZ instead of passing a specific file, because otherwise you have to manage those files. You have to manage those files. I also maintain a mirror of the database that I ship with every new release, but I don't do a release every time there's a new time zone. So, uh, so uh, you can build yourself. You can pull, you can pull the time zone data from my uh, mirror uh, and then use it directly, and then use it directly. But ideally, you have your own time zone data. Um, uh, and then the second question was. Uh, how does the parser oh, the work parser. internally? How does the parser oh, the work parser. internally? Just uh, high level. It's not. It, it's it's like a legitimate parser where it uh, tokenizes it and lexes it, and then it uh, just, it uh, just looks for stuff that looks like dates. Um, I, I, but I, I really think the real issue with that is that it's very opaque and it's not modular and it's not modular. So that's what I'm looking for comments on. Is that you know my hope is and, and I think date parser, uh, which is a, another library, another library just wrote their own parser that does something very similar where they let, allow you to specify more um, like a list of possible based of possible dates and they have a slightly different uh, aim um, but anyway we can talk about that more but uh, I, I can talk at length I can talk at length about that uh, you have a question have you seen the ex time library from DevMod? from no what is it ex to know what is it ex time ex time what is it uh, go take a look at it for many of the parsing and Higher level APIs All right, that you've yeah. been asking about. Okay, I'll do that. All right. Good question. A question about any, any kind of gotchas you want to warn people about. And there's some kind of weird edge cases with like a time object that's exactly midnight, that's called midnight, that's false either on these consumer events. Mm -hmm. So if you're like going to check if the time exists, you would expect midnight to be valid time. It's mm -hmm. not valid time. It's mm -hmm. not. Are there any other kinds of things like that? Well, I mean, you can take yourselves. There's a lot of things around time zones that are very complicated, that are very complicated, like, and, like, counterintuitive. Like, for example, in um, Samoa, there was no December 30th, or 30th, 19, 
2011. It went directly from December 29th uh, at midnight to December 31st, 31st uh, because they moved over from UTC minus 11 to UTC, UTC plus 14. Uh, plus 14, obviously, a ridiculous, a ridiculous uh, time zone offset. Um, also, you know, you can make, there, I mean, there's so many things you can say, like uh, Morocco, for example. Morocco, for example, usually you think you either have zero daylight savings transitions or two. Morocco has four, but only when Ramadan occurs in the, in the summer, occurs in the, in the summer, and only if their, uh, um, if their legislature passes a new bill every time. So this year, they have four here. They have four because in Ramadan, you know, you're not allowed to eat until after s sundown. So daylight savings time is artificially prolonging sundown, prolonging sundown in terms of civil time. So during Ramadan, they push it back because everyone just, you know, goes to work at noon and then, like, it is hungry all day. It is hungry all day. So uh, they, they're like, well, we don't want to do that during Ramadan. So they go daily savings back and forth, but then, you know, and forth, but then, you know, Ramadan drifts around during the, the year. So eventually there'll be, you know, there will be different overlaps, different overlaps. So, yeah, I mean, the big gotchas about time zones, though, are about ambiguous dates, and PyTZ handles those much better. He handles those much better for now. Uh, if you're using PyTZ, though, um, adding or subtract, doing arithmetic on time zone, on time zone aware things is not a winning proposition. I think DateUtil handles that better than PyTZ, um, but you know, you know, there's an argument to be made for the fact that that might be a fool's errand because it's kind of dangerous. Like you're really supposed to either do your operation, either do your operations on your like additions or generate R rules on completely naive time zones or UTC, like, uh, like, uh, and then apply your time zones at the end. All right. Any other questions? Oh, yes. uh, so, oh, yes. uh, so you mentioned in the talk uh, that if the if that person's birthday in the in the parser was April, it could potential it could potentially. Uh, oh, yeah. This is I think I saw this on a, st a Stack Overflow bug. Um, basically, what it does is what it does is it's it's just trying to find anything that's date related, right? So when when you when you go with um, when you go with a fuzzy parsing, when you go with a fuzzy parsing, this is going to say, all right, is this date related or not? If it is, I apply the normal rules. If it's not, I throw it away. Uh, so if this guy, uh, so if this guy, if this was April Marita instead of Pat Marita, it would say April Marita. Okay, this is in April, and then it would keep going. It would, it would keep going. It would find June. It would be like, well, I already know the month is April, so let's forget this June nonsense. That's probably someone's name, and then we'll give you the rest. And then we'll give you the rest of the the, the date. So th it would parse probably as like April 28th, and you know, if it was June, uh, it was June. Uh, if it was July 31st, mm -hmm. right? Then it would give you an error because it would be like, well, April 31st isn't real. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the improvements to the parser I think will hopefully add some something to that. But um, you know, there's not much that can be done when it's real fuzzy like that. When it's real fuzzy like that. Okay. Yeah, because I was just thinking if yeah, because if you're putting something into this parser function automatically, automatically, uh, yeah. you know, it could be troublesome to you know pre-filter it to say, oh, if the month, yeah. if I the mean, person. If I mean, the person's name is the real issue is that the parser gets zero context. So the more context you can give it, if you can pull out sections, of the, pull out sections of the date you already know and mm -hmm. pre-parse them or whatever, and just put them in a known format. If you really need to parse the rest of it, um, you know that, you know that really helps. So like for example, you guys probably all got a ticket that said like admit one uh, Pi Gotham. On that, it had printed zero seven printed zero seven two zero one six. Right uh, now, we happen to know that it is July of 2016. So if we saw that in context, if we saw that in context, we know that that's just referring to the month of July in 2016. However, DateUtil does not know anything like that. It'll see anything like that. It'll see 072016, and it'll say, "Oh, that must be July 20th, 2016." Uh, so, uh, so you know, that is uh, it's not a huge error, but it just illustrates that context is actually kind of important. And and, and uh, when you're parsing, just when you're trying to be auto magical, it's it's tough. Like mm -hmm. you without context. Okay. All right. All right. Is that all the questions? All right. Thanks for listening to the talk.